Good evening. I am not Mike Wartell. But on behalf of Chancellor Wartell and everyone here at IPFW, I'd like to welcome you to the second event of the 2011-2012 Omnibus Lecture Series. My name is Bill McKinney, and I'm the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. And while it is an absolutely beautiful evening here in Northeast Indiana, I am also equally delighted when people of national prominence visit our campus to enrich the educational experience that is IPFW. I understand that tonight's speaker, William Dunkelberg, met with an international business class this afternoon for a Q&A session. That level of interaction with our students and with our faculty is an absolutely priceless part and uh, a really priceless part of the IPFW experience. You know, IPFW is celebrating a very special omnibus anniversary this omnibus season. This is the 17th year of the series, and in April, coming up, April of 2012, we will be presenting our 100th omnibus lecture. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, since 1995, we have been delighted and pleased that the Omnibus Lecture Series has been sponsored by the English Bonner Mitchell Foundation, whose support has allowed IPFW to host these 100 outstanding, entertaining, and remarkable national and international personalities. I would also like to thank this evening our 2011-2012 media sponsors, Wayne TV and Northeast Indiana Public Radio. All of our speakers, without question, all of our speakers have been memorable. Many of you, some of you, I would imagine, have been to all of them. I've only been here since 2008, so I've only been able to see it since that time. But all of our speakers have been memorable, and their lectures were offered free of charge to the campus and, of course, to the public. We would like to invite every one of you to join in this 100th lecture celebration by telling your own omnibus story. And of course, to do that, we have a website. We, if you turn your browser to omnibus lectures, one word, omnibuslectures.org, go ahead and click on that. You can tell your favorite omnibus story. Talk about who was your favorite speaker or speakers and why. We would love to have that information as we work toward our 100th Omnibus Lecture in April. You can also take part of the celebration, of course, by attending that very special 100th lecture in April. The date and event are secret, and I have been sworn to that secrecy. They will be announced in the month of March. The only thing that I can say about it at this point is please, please do not miss it. You will absolutely enjoy it. Let me remind you of the format of this evening's event. After Dr. Uh, Dr. Dunkelberg's lecture, uh, there will be a question and answer period, of course, as always. There is one microphone stand uh, here in the, in, in, in the lower level. And, and by the way, let me also say a word of thanks. I know uh, many of you here in the room had, uh, had tickets for the mezzanine level, but uh, since we have a, a smaller and more intimate gathering this evening, I, uh, we are very, very grateful to have all of you down here this evening. Uh, so after the lecture, as per usual, there will be the question and answer period. Uh, we have the microphones available so that we ask that you line up at the microphone to ask your question. Uh, everyone will have the opportunity to ask a question uh, rather than standing up and, and asking questions from, uh, from your seat. And now, as is usual, uh, our tradition as a rule here with Omnibus is to invite one of our faculty members to introduce our speaker. And so I will be very pleased uh, to talk to you about Dr. Geraldine Miller, who will be introducing William Dunkelberg this evening. Dr. Miller is an associate professor of finance in our Dormer School of Business. She is the director of the IPFW Institute for Pension Plan Management. Her research interests center on public policy matters involving retirement planning and insurance, along with business ethics. She came to IPFW in 2000 after a lengthy career as a practitioner in the Illinois public sector, having held managerial positions in both the public and private sector. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Jerry Miller. Jerry. Good evening. 
Our guest speaker comes to us at a particularly important time given our current economic uh, situation. He is a nationally known authority in several subject areas, small business, entrepreneurship, consumer credit and consumer behavior, and government policy. He has testified before both, mem uh, both houses of Congress on a variety of topics ranging from tax reform and minimum wage issues to energy efficiency standards to monetary and fiscal policy. He has appeared on a variety of news programs, including all of the major broadcast networks, along with shows such as Bloomberg and Good Morning America. He frequently provides commentary on local news stations as well, and has been quoted in some of America's top publications, such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Time Magazine, US News and World Report, USA Today, and Newsweek. He's a consultant to ABC News and sits on many boards, both business and philanthropic. He's a prolific writer. He has written several books, articles, and reports, and there are simply too many to name here individually. He has served as the Dean of the School of Business and Management at Temple University, did that from 1987 through 1994, and a friend of mine, who he happened to have hired at Temple University at the time, says he's a great guy to work for. And that's high praise coming from this particular friend whom we have nicknamed Eeyore. <laughs> no small compliment. Here to speak to us this evening about unemployment and how to fix it, I am very honored to present to you Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Advancement and Study of Entrepreneurship at Temple University, Professor William Dunkelberg. Thank you. Jerry, thank you very much. Of all the introductions I've ever had, yours is definitely the most recent. <laughs> and it was very nice. Thank you, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Ruth and her traveling husband, uh, Michael, uh, for their hospitality this evening. That was great. And uh, uh, I'd like to also thank Al Zacker for, Al's out here somewhere, for getting me uh, hooked up. We had lunch together. Oh, I see him down there now. We had lunch together, and <clears throat> we, had, we were both a little on in years, although he's got more years than I have on him. But uh, we had to, I noticed we had to yell at each other a little bit at lunch. And it reminded me of a story and I'll, about a gentleman, and I'll use Al as the example. Al w went to the doctor for his annual physical exam, and he, and he was uh, talking to the doctor. He said, you know, I'm really concerned about my wife. I think she's losing her hearing. How can I kind of check it out without really, you know, asking and embarrassing her? He said, the doctor said, well, here's what you can try. Get into a room, kind of one away from where she is, and ask her a question. And if you don't get an answer, then move a little closer and ask the question again, and then, you know, you'll keep doing that until you get an answer, and you'll find out. So that evening, he gets into the living room, which is, joins the kitchen, and she's in there working away, and he, and he yells, and he says, hey, honey, what's for dinner tonight? No answer. So he moves closer, goes to the entryway, kind of, and says, hey, honey, what's for dinner tonight? No answer. So he moves into the kitchen. Honey, what's for dinner tonight? Nothing. Gets right up next to her. Honey, what's for dinner tonight? She turns around and said, Al, for the fourth time. <laughs> oh, well. So that happens to us. What can I say? So we've got a little technology here. I am going to, uh, I'll hope it works. Top button, move the slides. Is that the deal? You can see I do lots of things now in addition to being a professor. I started, uh, well, I did all of my graduate work at, uh, and undergraduate work at Michigan. You've heard of Michigan. And uh, all right, go blue. And my first teaching job was at Stanford. That was exciting. That was quite nice. It doesn't snow there. Uh, and I enjoyed that. But then I moved back to Purdue where I taught for over a decade and kind of got my children through school. And then I went to Temple. And, uh, I've been there since 1987, my, the first big city I've ever lived in. It's, it was very nice, so I've really enjoyed it. I've had a, a great experience 
uh, in the academic community, but I've also had lots of opportunity to get into the real world, which I have found very helpful in my teaching. So one of my fun things, kind of real worldy, is of course serving as the chief and only economist for the National Federation of Independent Business. And FIB has 350,000 member firms nationwide, and I take a random sample of that file every month and mail out questionnaires and collect data. So I've collected data on the small business sector of the economy for 37 years now, starting at when I was out at Stanford. And I'll use a lot of those data tonight to kind of share with you what's happening in the economy so we can get a sense of how did we get into the position that we're in uh, and what can we do maybe to get out of it? What's going to happen to it? So let's try to see if it works. That didn't work. Try this. Try this one. Try this. Oop, volume. Try that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I thought you'd be at my age, you should be impressed that I figured this out. I love it with the young people, you know, just take the stuff and they just do it. And uh, all right, so here's this is, it's what I call a graphic indicator. And of course, what we're hoping is nobody flushes. Uh, so the worry I think about a, a, a second recession is probably overdone, but it's something that we worry about. This is my job. <laughs> Tell you where we are, <laughs> which way we're going. And I wrote down at the bottom, I said, two ways out, neither is going to be pleasurable, all right? And I, it's a very important thing for us to keep in mind, and, I, and I, there, there are so many dimensions to that, but I'll just pick one. In general, what we have done, not just here in the United States, but globally, is try to live beyond our means, try to get more than we really can afford to get. And of course, we did that during the housing boom. Uh, you know, we really reached too far, et cetera, et cetera. We did that. <clears throat> but our governments have also done that on our behalf. They have promised us much more than they have made us pay for. And consequently, you know, we're ha we have a lot of trouble. So I'll, I'll use Greece and Germany as a great example. Greece, as you know, is in trouble. It's not very big. It's only 2% of the GDP of that whole Euro area. So, you know, if it disappeared, they wouldn't miss them too much anyway. Because, if, you know, if the area grows 4% and then just lose that kind of... So, but here's what happened in, in Greece. Greece, you know, liked to do nice things for its population. And so, and including providing jobs, so something like 20% of the population works for the government. Uh, the government has this list of hazardous occupations, which includes uh, hair dryer, hairdresser and, uh, and radio announcer. I'm not sure why those are hazardous, but they're included. And if you, have, if, you're one of, if you have one of those occupations, you can retire at 50 on a government pension. They try to keep things cheap. For example, the trains, the trains are inexpensive to ride on. So the revenue on the train system for the government's about 100 million euros, but the labor costs are 300, and other costs are another 400. Well, obviously there's a problem here. And so how, did they, how have they solved that? How have they been able to allow these nice things to happen without taxing? The Greeks famously don't pay taxes. Well, the answer is they borrowed the money. So the Greeks borrowed from the Germans. And the German banks lent them the money because they thought this is, this is government debt, it's safe. But of course, finally, the Germans and the French and others have figured out that the Greeks can't pay it back. And so now the party's over. Well, when, when you can't borrow any more money to do this, obviously life gets very difficult. And so you have to suddenly cut spending, cut benefits, cut pensions, and it's a very unpleasant adjustment. But there's really no way to get around it. There are no easy ways out. There, everybody can't be a winner anymore. So right now we're looking at what's going on over there. We're trying to figure out who's going to win, the Greeks or the Germans. So if the Greeks win, that is, they won't have to have the austerity. Uh, they can keep borrowing some money and, and the cuts won't be so bad. They'll be nice, but they'll win at the expense of the Germans, who lent them the money but now can't get it back. Uh, if the Germans win, they'll collect the money and life will be very miserable for Greeks. And that's, and that's where we are. And so we're trying to negotiate our way through that, not just over in Europe, but of course with our housing mess, the whole thing. We're trying to figure out who the winners and losers are, where they are, how are we gonna resolve all of this, and then how do we stop doing the kinds of things that got us into this trouble? And that's what we have to worry about. So here you go, it says, what are you offering you peasants in the, the speech today? Well, nothing they can afford to reviews. I promise you free health care, free housing, free clothing, food stamps and jobs for everybody. Any questions? Yeah, what do I need a job for? 
students remember that. So we try to worry, worry about that. It says after graduation, you'll need to know all the, how to fill out all the government forms. I'll let you read that list. And, and you can see that we do need jobs. And here's a, here's a, a good illustration. The blue line is, the, is what we call gross domestic product. Everybody know what gross domestic product is? It's not, we call it gross not because it's ugly when you pile it up, but because we don't subtract depreciation, uh, that is the, use, the using up of capital equipment to make stuff. So we call it gross instead of net. Gross domestic product, the total value, the total of all final goods and services produced in the economy. So there's a pile of stuff there, all right? And you can see GDP runs up there toward that black line, which marks the peak in that expansion, which occurred in December, officially, in December of uh, 07. So in January of 08, the recession starts, the slowdown starts, officially the recession. And you can see that the blue line falls, so GDP falls, we're making less stuff. Uh, but now we're just about back to where we were. So we've just about attained the peak that we had in 07. The red line is employment. So it's on the left margin, you can see how many people we had employed. So we got up to close to 140 million people employed. And then, of course, that started tailing down. And the problem is that it has not come back, all right? So we are now making about the same amount of stuff that GDP values, about the same, using 7 million fewer workers. Now, how did that happen? And it's a pretty simple story, actually, <clears throat> but one that's really hard to deal with. Normally, you and I, consumers, uh, lead us out of a recession. You know, we, we put off buying things in the recession, so we're pent-up demand is big, we buy stuff. And with interest rates low from the Federal Reserve, housing picks up coming out of recession. So housing and consumer spending lead us out of the recession. This time, consumer spending is dead and housing is dead. And so what has happened is the manufacturing sector and the agriculture sector has let us out, primarily through growth and exports. We export a lot of stuff, and we'll talk about it just briefly. But so now we've had this big increase in manufacturing output. So the pile is big again, but it has different stuff in it. It's missing a million housing starts. A million houses are missing. And instead, we have in there Caterpillar tractors and all kinds of other stuff, the manufacturing goods that we made and exported. So we're making all that stuff. The problem is that the manufacturers don't need many workers to make more of this stuff. And so we've got the stuff made now, but we don't have the people back to work. And the whole idea here is that we want everybody who wants a job to have a job. And that's why we have this concept of the unemployment rate. So it says, hey, the recession's over, pass it on. But we still have an unemployment rate of 9.1 million and roughly eight or nine, depending on the measure you want, 10 million people who are unemployed that would prefer to have a job if they could have one. So this is just helpful for you. you talk all the talk about a recession. You want to know what a recession is. Recession is when you get socks and underwear for Christmas. That used to happen to some of us, right? <laughs> all right, so how do we get into trouble? Well, the blue line is the share of our pile of GDP that we spend on consumption, partying, all right? So consumption is all of our spending except when we buy a new house, which we count as investment. It's a new asset, gives 30 years of return unless it's in Florida when you have a hurricane take it out early. But so you can see it was pretty stable there, about two thirds of GDP for a long time. So we always tell the students consumption is two thirds of GDP. But notice in the late 1990s, we started to party. And so we partied on up to a new high. I don't know if this has a little red light on it or not. It does, oh, green light, okay up to this new high here in 2000. But understandable, because in 2000, employment was the highest that we've ever had in history. 64.5% of the adult population had a job, compared to 58% today. All right, so this was a good time. But then, of course, at the end of 2000, the stock market crashes. We get 9-11 uh, coming in a recession in 2001, and all kinds of bad things happen. We should have taken our consumption back down to a normal kind of share of our income here but we didn't, we partied on to all time new highs. All right, now how do we do that? Well, this line, red line, is one of the answers. That's the savings rate out of disposable income. And you can see in the olden days, we used to save 10, 12% of our after-tax income. But that went all the way down to 1% here, 1%. So we were spending everything that we got, all right? And then in 2008, fourth quarter, Bad things happen. Lehman Brothers went out, Bear Stearns went out, all kinds of problems in the financial markets all around the world. Secretary Paulson said, we're on the verge of a depression. And we said, maybe we should start saving. 
Well, this is nothing to write home about, but we kind of went from one to six, all right? Each percentage point in the savings rate is $100 billion of consumer spending. So at an annual rate, we, you and I, stop spending half a trillion dollars. Boom, gone. Now this was really painful for the economy because we had built the whole economy based on you're not saving. So we had too many re retail stores, too many strip malls, too much inventory on the shelves, too much, too much, too much, too many employees to take care of you, and then you just didn't come. And that started really the, the major uh, deep part of the recession, which is the fourth quarter of 08 and the first quarter of 09, when GDP fell uh, four to five percent at an annual rate, which is almost unheard of to have those kinds of declines. So the, the other thing we did is this, borrowed money. So this green line here is the total amount of debt we have, including all of our leases on cars and all the kinds of debt obligations we have. Again, you can see right here around 2000, we start going, we start the party here. This line, I just said, well, let's suppose we had taken our debt to income ratio here and kept it. Where would the debt level be? If we just used the same debt to income ratio, just kept the same ratio. Obviously, GDP is growing. We have more people here. This is the line we would be on. That looks kind of sensible. This looks insane, but that's where we are. So this is all the extra debt we took on. This is allegedly taking care of that problem, but obviously at a very slow rate. We are not paying off the debt as fast, so we're stuck with a very heavy debt burden here. But that's how we financed that party. And of course, life was very exciting here. Lots of spending, huge amount of spending. We spend in this country far more than we make. And of course, we have to import stuff to take care of that, as we'll see. So you can see here, Here's the, here's the consumption ratcheting up, and here's the debt kind of that we're incurring to pay that along the way. Now, because of the fact that the dollar is a special currency, instead of getting inflation with all that, and we're borrowing money from everywhere. So we have, in the old proverbial textbook sense, too many dollars chasing too few goods. So we all have all, we have money from everywhere, and we're spending it. <clears throat> Normally that would cause inflation, but because a dollar is widely accepted around the world in exchange for stuff, we didn't get inflation. Instead, we get an amazing trade deficit. This thing here is the zero line, so we go down to almost $800 billion. What is the trade deficit? It's the difference between what we export and what we import. So we import about $2 trillion worth of stuff. Today, we export about $1.5 trillion worth of stuff. Remember when you were a kid and you trade, you count to three and then you trade so that nobody gets screwed, technical term in economics. <clears throat> a lot of bad stuff going on here, right? So all of this here is people giving us stuff, wine, cars, computers, cell phones, all kinds of stuff that we import, and we're giving them what in exchange? dollar bills, IOUs, all right, that's it. Now, that's not a good deal unless the dollars are good for something, and that's why people are willing to take them. There's a country by the name of Zimbabwe, and I have with me a $10 trillion Zimbabwe note that, of course, will buy you nothing because nobody will take it, but you can spend a dollar in all, any country in the world. You can't spend euros here or yen here, but you can spend dollars anywhere. So when the Chinese buy oil from the Russians, they don't pay with renminbi, they pay with dollars, because renminbi is not a currency in Russia. When Russia buys fruit from South America, it doesn't pay with rubles, because rubles are not currency in South America. They pay with dollars. So the dollars are used worldwide, which is why it's very important for us to have the value of the dollar pretty stable and not have inflation, because some people need to know that if they have a dollar in their pocket, <clears throat> a year later they can buy the same amount of stuff that's a good currency, and that's what we really need to watch out for. So this is the party. It's still amazingly large. We still have about a half a trillion dollar trade deficit, which means the rest of the world is lending us that money. This is money that we are being lent, if you will, and therefore invested uh, in U.S. financial assets. All right, so there's more adjustment to come, but uh, at least half of it seems to kind of be done. Of course, with all that debt that we have, we're having trouble paying it off. So that's the delinquency rate on houses. On, this is on commercial real estate, credit cards, et cetera. It's all getting better, but still tough. All right, so this is our concern. Do we have the house of cards that is going to collapse? Is this debt going to take us down? Or are we going to muddle through it and, get, and declare the winners and losers 
and then get on with life, which is what we need to do. Well, you can see consumers aren't very happy about it. This is the University of Michigan Index of Consumer Sentiment. I did this thing for five years at a date that would be somewhere to the left of this one. And so I'm very familiar with it. It's the all-time 50-year high is right there in 2000. We, we thought the world was changed, we'd be rich forever. Didn't happen. Um, this is where we are now. So the, the August-September reading is the lowest we've seen since 1980, when the, we started another bad recession period, the 80-82 period. So these dashed lines, when you see them, will kind of tell you where the current period is relative to everything else, and you can kind of follow. So that's, they're very pessimistic. Well, if consumers are pessimistic, will they spend? If they're not spending, then do I need to hire anybody? No. All right, so this is one of our problems here. We have to think about, well, why is this the case? You can see that our net worth isn't doing so badly now. Here's our net worth. This is trillions. You notice we had 14 trillion in total debt? Yeah, but we have a lot of assets. So subtracting our debt, we're still sitting here at about $55 trillion net worth in the United States for consumers. Not bad. That's why the Chinese are perfectly happy to lend us money. Our balance sheet looks very good. But you can see here, this is the dot-com bubble when stocks became valuable. <clears throat> but more people own homes than stocks. This is the housing bubble. And so we thought we were really wealthy, but of course, we were just kidding ourselves. You know? But a lot of us spent money based on that, and of course now we're stuck paying it back, and that's the difficulty we have. So as I'm talking about small business, I just want to give you a few stats here. 90% of all the employer firms in the United States have fewer than 20 employees, 90%. 99% have fewer than 500. That's the number the SBA uses for small, but small for them, for the SBA being a political organization, includes all the, about all the firms that there are, 99%. But anyway, I'll give you a sense of the size. We produce half of the private GDP. Taking government out of the GDP, we produce half of it, all right? And of course, we employ over half of the private sector workforce and create two-thirds of the new jobs. Why? Well, because the only way you get job growth in a country is if you have population growth. And population growth really means more barbershops, more nail salons, more little restaurants, more. So most of those jobs are not very exciting, all right, but they they're two-thirds of the new jobs that we get. Then you get new stuff, you know, you get high-techy stuff, uh, things like that that create the other, the other jobs. Well, they're very important to the economy. Here's my small business optimism index. You can see 1980. Second quarter was bad for owners as well. Owner optimism was terrible then, but only for the quarter. And then we rebounded, and of course, 83 started a nice run. Here's 2003, and look how many years we have been now at a recession level. So I take surveys in the first month of each quarter. That's what I call quarterly, January, April, July, and October. But I do the monthlies too, so I put August and September in here for you. Uh, I'll replace those with the October survey when I get them. But you see, we're not going anywhere here. So owners are pessimistic about the future. And if they're pessimistic about the future, are they going to hire? Are they going to expand? Are they going to make capital expenditures, raise worker productivity? No. Well, you can see how we have, how the index is tracked in this recovery. So this always starts at the, at the end of the recession, the official end of these recessions. This is the 1980-82 period. This, this, so this is first quarter of 83. And you can see optimism was really big coming out of that 80-82 period. And we grew 8% at an annual rate. The GDP did. That was really good. This is, this is the current one. You can see we're really way off the mark here. So it's the worst recovery in owner optimism that we've seen in any recession since 1970 when we collected data. Here's reported change in past sales quarter on quarter. Can you tell when you stop spending here? Sure. It's pretty obvious, right? I mean, it just crashed. And profits crashed with it. Looked the same way. How about looking forward into the future? Do you think the real volume of goods and services you sell will be higher or lower? Well, this is a bad number. It's a negative number. More firms think that their sales will be lower three months than higher. Going to hire? No. So those people are not really excited. How about business conditions six months from now? Will business conditions be better or worse six months from now than they are today? Well, we're down here at a minus 22 right there. That means 22 percentage points more think will be worse off, the economy will be worse, than think it'll be better in six months. Again, with that kind of view of the future, you are not going to put money down and bet by buying new equipment, hiring workers that may or may not pay for themselves, whatever. So <clears throat> today, I guess the stock market was up. 
I don't, I don't know, yesterday. We, no, we, we have a lot of ups and downs. The, the dollar, of course, is shrinking, uh, which has been very helpful for manufacturing and agriculture, but not if you want to go to Tuscany for a vacation. And uh, I think the bull recovered today a little bit. But these are the kinds of things that we struggle with every, every day now that we worry about uh, where, we're, where we're going to be in the future. So here's the unemployment rate. You can see we were this high once before, uh, but we've been high longer here. Each one of these dots is a quarter. So it's been a long time here that the unemployment rate has been very high, and that's certainly not good for us. There's the percent of adults employed. There's 2,000, 64.5% of the population, adult population, people age 16 and over, had a job then. Here's where we are now. So we got a long way to go. Now, we won't go back to 64.5 because in the denominator, as anybody who's over the age of 16, that includes Al and me. All right, but there's some point which Alan, Al and I will not have jobs. That is, we won't be interested in a job, we'll be retired. So we can't, we won't be in the numerator, have a job. So we won't get back to that number, but we certainly have to get much better than this by putting a lot of people back to work. You can see, again, when you, did, you and I didn't show up, we had to cut costs. Look what we did. So that's the change in average employment for a firm. Boom, we had to fire people. 80% of our costs our employment costs. Not for big firms that are capital intensive. If you have an assembly line and no workers on it, you know, your labor costs are not very big. But for, for small firms, we're very labor intensive. We dominate the service sector. And so we just had to fire people like crazy. And the, the number for September, which I announced yesterday on CNBC and Bloomberg later in the day, not a good number. Minus 0.3 workers per firm on average. That's not good. And of course, the jobs number turned out to be uh, not so good uh, last Friday, which we thought. You can see what the process has been. The blue line is the percent of firms who said, I cut employment. So here it is, cut, 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 cut. But look, cutting employment is kind of back to normal if you can think of normal cutting employment, right? I mean, so it's back down. What hasn't come back is the red line, which is, uh, I lost my little pointer there. Oh, getting exciting here. Tech always gets me. What hasn't come back here? is the red line, which is the percent of firms who are hiring, increasing jobs, creating jobs. And that's what we need to see pick up. But of course, you have to have a reason. So do you have job openings hard to fill? No. With all so much unemployment, job openings are pretty easy to fill. And so that's a very low number. You'd like to see things like that in 2000, or even this in 2003, where we had lots of demand for labor. Uh, do you plan to increase or decrease the total number of people working for you over the next three months? Increase or decrease the total number, meaning create jobs. The answer is not many, a net 4%. So four percentage points more plan to increase their employee base than plan to cut it. But we still have people planning to cut it. That's not good. These are the kinds of numbers we need to be seeing, and I just can't find them up here. Uh, that would be typical if we were having a good expansion. There are many things that stand in the way, of course, of getting employment done. I, I, I have testified over the, well, a lot of years on the minimum wage. This is just an illustration of why it's a bad idea. First half of 2009, GDP falls 4% at an annual rate. We're making less stuff. We're in recession. Remember, we said that was, it was the fourth quarter of 08 and the first quarter of 09 that was the worst. All right. And we fired 250,000 16 to 19-year-olds. There will be a few of those in the audience here. <clears throat> then in the second half, the recession's over right here, June of 09, we hit bottom, so the recovery starts officially, and sure enough, GDP grows in the second half 4%. So now the pile of stuff's going up, we're making more hamburgers and selling them, pushing them out the window, that's good. So we should have required, we should have had more people working for us. We fired 580,000 teens in the second half. 580,000. Why? Well, I think a big reason is Congress raises the minimum wage 10.6% in July. Well, you know, that means the hurdle that a young person has to get over, that is value they have to bring to the firm to cover at least the cost of hiring them, just went up by 10%. I don't know how many of you think, you know, no people have got 10% raises in the 2009 recession period, but not many. This is a very bad idea, and if you're doing things like this, how can you create jobs? This is job destruction not creation. 
I always argued that you know we you should create we should take if you want to take credit for jobs created you need to take credit for jobs you destroyed as well by bad having bad policies. Let's talk about housing. This whoops here we go. This is the this is housing starts. So it goes up here. This is all starts. This would be condos and apartments and single family houses. Look at that. You can see that in the fourth quarter of 06, we were building houses at a 2.2 million annual rate. How many houses do we need? Well, basically, it's a function of population and household formation. All right, so here's, here's kind of a trend line I put in based on household formation and growth in population. That's how many houses we kind of need to start every year, all right, in order to accommodate that. <clears throat> nice and smooth, it isn't that way right now. Uh, obviously, household formations are down because we can't get any of the kids to leave the house because there's no job to be had, right? So there's a little doubling up, but this is just a good idea. So you can see, this is all, these are all houses we've built that there's nobody in America to live in. Nobody. And I don't know about you, but even if I give you a brand new house for 60K, how many of you want a second home, especially 10 states away, which is where they are? No, you know, it's, you get it cheap, but you can't sell it because nobody wants them. That's why we're selling it to you cheap, and you got taxes and maintenance, and these are not easy to get rid of. So we realize we're in trouble, finally. We said, and when you're in a hole, what are you supposed to do? Stop digging. So we did, and here we are down here now. This is the number of starts. So somewhere in America, we need 500,000 new starts, right? which means uh, it's new areas that are developing, and we have population growth, so we don't have enough houses, but it's really low numbers. So here's the million short. We should be kind of here on trend demographics. We're here. This is a million housing starts. How many new jobs go with a housing start? I don't know, but several, you know, and for nine months, it takes nine months to put the house up. So three, four, five people kind of every day are there doing something. All right, then there's all the furniture you buy and the rugs and the stuff. I mean, there are a lot of jobs tied up here. I think this, in fact, is the biggest part of that big jobs gap we looked at in the early chart. All right, so if we're a million housing starts short and there are five starts, five new jobs per start, that's five million jobs. All right, say four million, but that's the big piece of that seven million workers that we don't have working today because there aren't a million houses in the GDP pile. Got the picture? That's kind of the situation we're in. Now, how do you cure that? You wait, you wait. Either that or we get the government to buy houses and burn them, which might be just as good as buying treasuries, you know, which is what the Fed is doing, right? But we have an excess supply. We can't even move it where it's needed. If we could, we could, of course, probably get rid of the excess supply faster, but they're all concentrated in certain areas. So it's a big, it's a big hang, overhang. We think there are like a million and a half still kind of extra houses we have to get rid of. Now, we can get rid of those in about two years with normal population growth. In the meantime, this is what's going to happen, and you're going to miss, we're missing all those jobs. So this is one reason why it's going to be very hard to get the unemployment rate back down, because housing just is not going to be a big piece of the equation. It'll keep coming back slowly, but it's going to take a while to get that, get that done. <clears throat> How about other capital outlays? Well, you can see that the percent of these small businesses who are buying new equipment, expanding their facilities, buying inventory, getting new computers, about as low as we've ever seen in a recovery. There it is right there. Here's the 2003, or the uh, 1983 recovery, certainly much, all of these are much better uh, in terms of the recovery. So again, we're really lagging way behind here. Now, I put this up just to ask you this question. How much can you pay one of these guys per hour? The answer is not very much because with that little shovel, they can't produce very much per hour, right? But one of these people coming to my little bank and borrowing money and getting a snowplow can make a lot of money. Why? Because he or she could move a lot of snow per hour. And that's what we pay for. That's productivity. You have to have that capital spend, spending to, to raise worker productivity. And when you do that, people get paid more money. That's why we get... That's why our standard of living rises in the United States. And of course, that also would free all these people up. Do something else useful, like take over another country or something, I, one of those things. But <clears throat> this, of course, is China's problem, is putting all these people to work in a productive way. And uh, that's probably not one of them. So you can see planned capital outlays, also recession low levels. You take that back in time, it's hard to find numbers this low. And when you do find them, they're only for a quarter or two count these little dots up, this is years 
where firms have not been willing to make the capital expenditures we need to raise worker productivity. Is now a good time to expand? Well, it was in 1983, but the answer here is no, 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 and no. That's the answer, and we, we need to get firms back up here thinking it is a good time to expand. So it starts to tell you what we think is probably wrong here. Why, why is this happening? And that is people don't have any confidence in what we're doing and that, that, that uh, we can fix the problems that we face. And so we'll look like Greece uh, in the not too distant future. So you can see here's the, again how laggy this is compared to uh, 83. Here's getting rid of the inventory. This is did you increase or decrease your inventory stocks? Well, you know, when you stop coming, we all were decreasing. So the zero line, remember, is up here. So here's your big inventory reduction program. We had to get rid of inventory and turn it into cash. And so you can see how big that was. And of course, <clears throat> we still don't need to add to any. So this is the net percent of firms who say, I'm going to order new stuff. You can see again, here's the zero line here. And here's where all these numbers are. So we aren't sending orders up to the big factories asking for more stuff. We don't need it. We don't have to put it on there. So how do we get rid of it? Well, we cut prices very dramatically. Here's the zero line. This is the net percent who raised prices. Well, notice it's big negative numbers. So down here, you're looking at 22 percentage points more firms cutting prices than raising prices. So it's a big fire sale out on Main Street, getting rid of all the inventory. We're now back where we're actually raising, more firms are raising prices than cutting but certainly not like this. This was the inflation, of course, going into the 1980s that Paul Volcker was appointed to the Fed to take care of, which he did. This was a little scare we had with energy prices in 08, but the collapse at the end of 08 certainly took care of that. We got rid of that problem. On the credit side, <laughs> it's Helicopter Ben. You know, he got that name when he was on the board when we were worried about deflation, which we're worried about again. Deflation is falling average prices rather than rising. And he said, not to worry, we can put money in the helicopters, fly out over Fort Wayne, dump the money out, and people will spend and that'll hold prices up. <clears throat> what Ben is finding in the conduct of monetary policy is you can liquefy people, but they won't necessarily spend the money. And uh, so that's the, what we call the liquidity trap. And we'll talk about it a little bit. That's a pretty picture, kind of, or it's a weird picture. It's a picture of the Federal Reserve's portfolio on the asset side. This is where they used to be. They used to have about eight or nine hundred billion dollars in assets, not quite a trillion, and most of it was treasuries. All right? But then Lehman Brothers and all those firms started getting into trouble, all right? because the mortgages they held as assets turned out to be not such great assets because people were defaulting on them. And you weren't supposed to default on mortgages. People don't do that. Well, they do. So the government started swapping treasuries for their assets. So they collected all this other stuff, which you can see those have pretty well wound down now. Uh, that was just to shore them up and make them look good so that people were worried. So Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan could have treasuries on their portfolio rather than mortgages. All right? So that was kind of a, a trade. But in the meantime, the, the government started acquiring them. So this whole space here is mortgage-backed securities that the Treasury has bought because Nobody else will, okay? And to keep the mortgage market working and to keep Fannie and Freddie flush with cash so they can keep buying mortgages, the Fed is buying all this kind of stuff. And of course, the Fed bought a lot of treasuries. So it's gone from about a $900 billion portfolio up to almost $3 trillion, all right? Now, people are calling this printing money in the, in the press. The Fed is printing money. It's not. If I buy your house from you, you are not any richer, you are just liquid. And my hope is that if I do that, you'll buy another house or you'll buy something. Well, of course, buying these, what the Fed is hoping is that if I buy the treasury from you, you will go find some other risky investment to put the money in, all right? But of course, we're not cooperating really well here because we don't want to take the risk. So this is what this is what we have to get rid of. The Fed does have to unwind all this because once you and I, so, well, let's take my little bank. The Fed could buy all of my assets, all the loans I made to the community businesses. They could buy them all from me, put them in their portfolio, and I'd have cash. But my problem at the bank, my little bank, is nobody's asking for it. So it sits there. 
That's the liquidity trap. But if once people start borrowing it, writing checks on it, buying something else, and then that check gets deposited, then the Fed has got to figure out, how do I take all this back? Because otherwise, we would have rapid growth in the money supply and, of course, an inflation problem. We asked the owners, what's the single most important problem facing your business today? You can see in the olden days, inflation is the all-time vote getter, and credit was a problem, but I defy you to find here on Main Street the credit crunch. Nobody is telling me that credit's their top problem. All right? And we find other interesting things like borrowing activity is at a 37-year low. We used to borrow a lot when the prime was at 21. We love paying 21 plus 3. Now we don't borrow. Nobody's borrowing, so very low borrowing activities. We asked them if they, if they got all the credit they wanted, all right? And 28% said, yeah, I got all my credit needs are met. 7% said no, um, but the lowest it's ever been is 4% back in 2000. And look at all the people who said no. I don't, I'm not interested in a loan. I have no interest. Why? Well, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to hire a worker who won't pay for him or herself? Am I going to get a new piece of equipment to produce output I cannot sell? So these people aren't interested. So it explains why, as I talk to the bankers around the country, they all agree with me, the same problem we have. We have money to lend. We have nobody coming in and asking for it. Well, we do have a few, but I mean, remember, we have to make a, a loan that's not real risky. So. We know good loan when we see one, we're just not seeing many applicants. All the good applicants are waiting for something to happen, all right? <clears throat> Here's some more on what's the most important problem, and you can see it's poor sales over here. Never before has it been that high for that long, poor sales. So you and I are not getting the job done here, I guess, that's the deal. So it says, find your next member of Congress here. That's me, less than one, don't spend more than you make. And this guy says, I don't get it. <laughs> and because he doesn't get it, spending is really sorted. So this is total government spending relative to GDP. And then you can see it's really soared really dramatically. And this is the deficit right here. So it's down about one, three, one, four trillion for how many quarters? So we're talking about a couple years here. We're adding all of that debt. The deficit means we're adding to the debt. And of course, we just had the debt ceiling debate, right? And we finally said, okay, you can take a couple more trillion. Look trillion up in the dictionary, it's a very large number. So we're doing it. <clears throat> this, of course, was the time we ran surplus. We actually reduced our indebtedness by hundreds of billions of dollars then. And, and of course, we, the reason we got all this revenue in here is because of Y2K.com. Remember, 64.5% of the population had a job and was sending in tax revenue back then. So this was a good time. Uh, it wasn't because, as some uh, politicians will tell you, that we raised taxes on rich people, which we did, right in here somewhere. But that's not why we got this money. This is all capital gains tax and, uh, and the fact that lots of us were employed and sending in money. And <clears throat> you can see that uh, we dipped a little bit, came back, but of course now... Uh, this is where we're operating. Now, why this worries us is this. If we want to build that million houses, if we want to buy more than 12 million cars, usually we buy 15 or 16 million. If we want to stop paying down our credit card and actually spend money, we need to borrow money. And the question is, will there be money there to borrow? So that person coming to me to get the snowplow loan, you know, what would happen if you didn't save any money? Well, there'd be no money in my bank and then I couldn't make a loan to buy a snowplow. Saving is really important. We talk about saving a, we, in a closed economy, meaning there's no China, just us in the room. A country can invest no more than it saves. Invest meaning creating new productive assets, not buying and selling stock. That's just swapping paper for paper. All right, we can't do it unless you save. That's why saving is so important. And we have been lousy savers, as you saw, and we've always been saved by the rest of the world lending us their savings and coming over here and investing in our country. They like investing in our country. So our concern is, you know, what happens when we want some money to build all those houses, to buy all those cars that we typically buy but aren't buying right now? I just put this up. A lot of people worry about defense spending. i just show you that we spend about a nickel out of every dollar of GDP on defense. It used to be a lot higher if you go back here. <clears throat> this, of course, when we won the Cold War, et cetera, we were able to 
really reduce it a lot. So just to put in perspective, that's a small part. It's a lot of money. It'd be nice if we didn't have to spend it. But there it is. So it says, uh, you made us contribute to Social Security for our entire careers because you couldn't be trusted with long-term financial planning the way I can. But now you want to apply a means test to our benefits because you've done extremely well, and I'm broke. How about this one? I like this. About our allowance, Dad. Given your income, we're not sure you're paying your fair share. Fair share. Okay. Just another trillion. Now's no time to be behaving responsibly, right? Uh, the government announced a new tax hike after the deal with the Nigerian banker's widow fell through. <laughs> And I can tell you've been on the computer <laughs> getting these things. Uh, uh, uh. So taxes are going to have to go up, that's for sure. So kind of here's where we stand. Right now, uncertainty, I think, is at a max. And the major source of uncertainty for us is government. We don't know what's going on. Do you know what your tax rates are going to be in two months? No. If you're an employer, do you know what the cost of hiring a worker is going to be with the health care? We don't even know if we're going to have health care, right? I mean, it could be unconstitutional, or the whole thing could be in play. We don't, there's so much we don't know about what's going on. We don't know about all the other regulations coming down. Regulation growth in the past year or two has been phenomenal, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new regs posted in the congressional record. The Federal Reserve has to write, they say, 405 new regs under Dodd-Frank. You know, and I know at our ba bank, we have our monthly board meetings, we spend most of our time worrying about dotting I's and crossing T's, not growing the business. We're just, we're buried with the regulatory stuff. Now, you know how many regs the Fed normally writes in a year? Four or five. They don't even know how they're going to do what they're supposed to do and, and then do it well. All right, so really, there's so much uncertainty, and it really it comes from here. Well, obviously very unsatisfied with what's going on. The Michigan index has gone, Michigan surveys have uh, been around for 50 years. The highest percentage in the history of the surveys in August said they disagree with current government policy, only 5% approved. So we don't like what's, what we're seeing. This is a sample of not voters, but households, okay? <clears throat> Lots of us are much more concerned with the whole problem of fiscal restraint than we are with unemployment. Why? Well, because most of us are employed. Nine out of 10 of us who want a job have a job. One out of 10 don't, they're the unemployed. That'd be like a 10% unemployment rate. They're obviously concerned about unemployment. We're, we have our jobs, most of us think we'll keep them. We're worried about having another cataclysmic event like we had back in 2007, 2008. That's what we're worried about. And we see Greece in our future if something doesn't happen. So we worry about that. The Fed's out of bullets, all right? There's, you know, the, they, uh, <clears throat> Ben Bernanke was asked in his hearing a couple days ago uh, how much he thought the 30-year Treasury rate would be reduced with this current policy called Operation Twist. And he said about 20 basis points. Well, I mean, mortgage rates are already at the historic low levels. 20 basis points? I mean, is that going to change how you and I... Now, the people on Wall Street are having fun with this because Operation Twist means selling short-term securities, buying long-term securities. There's all this arbitraging that can be done. They're busy playing with that. But on Main Street, it isn't going to make a difference to us. It cannot help us reduce unemployment a measurable amount. It's just not going to happen. So more stimulus for us may mean more debt and more fear, and if you're more afraid of the future tomorrow than you are today, you will spend less and save more, which is the logical thing for you to do. So I think this is what is really paralyzing us. I wrote, less is more if more government is what we're afraid of. <coughs> less is more. And so as long as we continue that course, you know, just having bigger and bigger, more stimulus packages, more borrowing, more, you know, it's not going to work very well for us. So. Again, just reminding you, you know, we've all been trying to live beyond our means, not just us as individuals, but the governments that represent us. They are promising far more than they're making us pay for, and they're try we're all trying to do it with debt, but there's only so much saving in the world, you know, and we, ca we can't do this game. So it's starting to come to an end, and we just want it to come to a, at least a managed bad end for somebody, but we have to declare the winners and get it done. Housing, as I said, takes time. We c you can't rush it unless the government starts buying and burning. Then, of course, that will bring housing construction back 
much more quickly. Now, arguably, that might not be such a bad idea because what's a house worth that you can't sell? Nothing, right? So, I mean, so you're not destroy you're destroying assets that don't have any market value. So maybe it's not a bad idea. I have to think about it, <laughs> but anyway. So we need to worry about growing the pie, not just redistributing it, redistributing it. I put Getty out there because when I was very young, I spent a weekend with J. Paul Getty uh, and his estate uh, in, in England. And it was very nice and very enjoyable. And Zsa Zsa Gabor was there. You don't even know who that person is? <laughs> Zsa Zsa was there. Anyway, the Brits decided they needed more money, and so they put on a wealth tax. What did J. Paul Getty do? He moved to L.A. The Getty Museum is there. <laughs> I mean, you can't do these kinds of things, right? They're always very counterproductive, but the politicians kind of don't get it. So anyway, so here we go. The jobs bill, obviously, uh, I don't like it. I don't think it's a good idea. It offers, you, it offers me a tax incentive to hire you. Now, if I'm looking at Al and thinking about hiring him, and say he's got a $30,000 salary. But, I, but remember, 40% of us think that the economy is going to be worse six months from now than, than it is today. So I don't think the chances uh, of him being able to pay for himself are very high. So don't hire him. Now the government says if you hire Al, we'll give you $4,000. Hmm. Well, now the hurdle is down to 26, but it only lasts for a year. I'll probably don't get the money until the end of the year. Then the full boat is on me, right? And and how are they going to pay for that jobs bill? With higher income taxes. So let's see, a temporary tax cut in exchange for a permanent income tax increase. Hello? I don't think that's going to fly very well. So, so th then we have these, the reduction in the amount of money that I have to pay for your Social Security. So if I had employed Al, I would have to pay six points, and he has to pay six points. Everybody remembers that. So I can cut it to three. So if I have... 10 workers like Al, earning 30000 my payroll is 300000 I get $9,000 of tax relief. That's really nice. I have 9000 in my hand now because I don't have to send it in. Does that make him look any better? And he is a good-looking devil, but... <laughs> Does that make him look better as a hire? No. It has nothing to do with he's still a bad investment. But I'll use the $9,000 to keep my other people employed while we suffer through the economy I think that we might have. So the jobs bill, is, it's a wrong set of incentives. It doesn't really give me a reason to hire somebody. Small businesses don't need tax cuts. They like tax cuts, and there are some that might make some sense. What they need is customers, right? If I've got customers, I'll hire, and I'll get new equipment. I'll get new delivery trucks. I'll do all those kinds of things that I need. So, so I said, it's all a matter of perspective here. I, I kind of like that. <laughs> First, the good news, sir, I count only one Indian. There are all these uncertainties out there, <laughs> and they're big, and they could be troublesome for us, um, and those are the things that we have to try to resolve. And once they get resolved, even if they aren't resolved in the best way for us, certainty is much better for businesses, large and small, uh, because then we can plan and do things. But this lady has the right idea. It says, lack of shoppers, stalling recovery. Well, I'm not about to stand idly by when my country needs me the most. God bless her. All right. <laughs> so I'm through lecturing to you, but I, I will entertain questions. Obviously, the outlook for, for economic growth is not good, you know, because the housing thing is so important and it's dead. Uh, the small business sector, apparently, from these charts, to me, is not growing. And we're half the economy. So you can't expect growth to be much better than 2% for GDP. That's about all we're going to get. Now, to fix the unemployment problem, we need 125,000 net new jobs a month just for population growth, take care of all these kids who are graduating. And we need, if you want to reemploy the 8 million or 7 or 8 million people who are unemployed for, during the recession, in three years, divide 8 million by 36 months, you get 225,000 a month. So you need 125 plus 225. 350, 300, 350 a month for three years to get us back to 07 levels of employment. All right now, how many jobs were, did we announce last Friday? 103,000 net new jobs, and 45,000 of those were just statistical counting of the Verizon workers who really had a job. They just didn't think the pay was good enough, so they come back. So it really is only like 60,000. That's the challenge. And it's going to be 
excuse me, it's going to be hard for us to step up to the plate and get that. But the hiring is going to be done not by GE, uh, not by GM. It's going to be done in the small business sector where all these people used to work. It's like the barbershop used to have five chairs busy, now it's three because people aren't getting a haircut. We have to fill that back up again with these workers, and it just takes consumer spending coming back, and it takes confidence to get that done. Okay, so inflation will be a little bit of a problem as we go forward, not because of what the Fed is doing, but just because price pressures are coming back. The price cutting is through. It was really good while we were getting rid of inventories, but now we're kind of back. So you get a little pressure there. Interest rates, the Fed has promised will keep, they'll keep them low, but, you know, if that helps you, fine, but right now, you know, they've been low for a long time and not helpful, and at least they won't stand in the way w should we suddenly decide to go borrow a lot of money and build houses, all right? So that'll be good. So that's kind of the scenario that we have, and let me see what you want to ask me and, and see if I can amplify on that not very exciting outlook. We got one. Dr. Dunkelberg, as, a, as an economist, how do you feel about uh, uh, Keynes' 999 proposal? <laughs> I like Herman Cain. Uh, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have trouble voting for him. Uh, it's a mixed bag, as everything is. It's never everything just right for you. I love the 9% flat tax rate. I think we, if we had a flat, we spend about seven billion hours a year filling out tax forms. That's more hours than we spend making all the cars, trucks, buses, and planes made in America. Just giving, gifting that back to us would be wonderful, right? Because we can send the same amount of money in for 10 minutes of work, and that could be done. So that would be a wonderful gift. And having a, a low marginal tax rate of 9 or 10 or 11 or 15, <clears throat> any of those would be much better from an incentive point of view. That's really, that's really good. Also, if we eliminated all deductions, of course, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't be angry about those 30 millionaires that pay no taxes. I mean, it's legal, but we get angry about that. So how can you not pay taxes, blah, blah, blah. So it'd be really nice if we could do it. So I like the, the low marginal tax rate is wonderful. That's the marginal tax rate part. <clears throat> the other important piece is the 9% sales tax. What's the sales tax in this state? Seven. Seven. So you've got to add nine to that. So that's 16. Um, and, and here's my problem with that. Um, but, you know, it might be unavoidable. <clears throat> I worked my whole life, and I have a million dollars in the bank. That's my retirement money. And I pay taxes on it all the way and all whatever I earned. But now you're going to cut this, the purchasing power of that by 10%, just like that. Okay, 9%. Boom. I mean, that's a, another big tax on stuff you've already taxed. And there are a lot of schemes to, that people talk about to fix that, but I find that would be very, to, very harmful for just the people we really don't want to harm, which is not rich people, but the poor pe poorer people, middle class poor people, would be really harmed by that. It's a regressive tax. It's a regressive tax. Now, that's just a factual thing. We don't like regressive taxes, but basically, if you have sales tax that, and poor people spend 100% of their income, they're taxed on 100% of their income. And rich people spend 10% of their income, they're only taxed on 10% of their income. So I have a lot of problems with, the, with that sales tax thing. Would I, would, I, would I not accept it? You know, we have to, there are a lot of negotiations we have to go through and we have to decide what it is we're trying to accomplish, what we're going to do with the revenue, you know, hopefully get rid of the deficit. But, but I, I, I like it. It's a bold plan. You know, the, we never put a plan in the way it comes out, but, uh, but it gets the discussion started. And I think, I think he would be a very able uh, leader in, the, in, uh, in government. I'd love to see him get elected to something. I think he's a, a terrific guy. I like the idea. So I think we can make something out of it that would be much better than we have today. And that's what we have to do. You know, what is it? Don't let the you know, perfect be the energy of making some progress, be the enemy of making some progress, and we don't want to do that. Yes, sir. Oh, over here. There. I don't think he's on. Uh, I thought you had mentioned, but you didn't, is the idea of a culture of spending. You touched on it, but not as much as I think it's important. For instance, I remember back with Jimmy Carter, 
wearing a cardigan, telling us to turn down the heat, being prudent, <laughs> having to do more with less. Right, cut off your credit card. Yeah. And then you have Ronald Reagan come into the White House, and first thing he does is get rid of the solar collectors. You can go ahead and spend more. Um, and then even after 9-11, what was the solution? Go out and spend. It's your patriotic duty. Tax cuts for everyone, whereas during the Clinton administration, they wanted to have a Cold War dividend to pare down the debt. So you speak about all of us. You speak about us trying to, we've been living beyond our means. But I don't think you really mean us as in me included with you. I mean, you're here at a college campus. You have students that are just trying to eke out a living, still eating top ramen. You have teachers that are worried about their future and, and are saving, bearing, bearing, being very prudent with things. But you're talking about us as if we are part of you, but we are not. For me, I don't fear government because government helps pay my, my, uh, my, my salary. Students don't fear government because government would equal more financial aid so they can go to college and they can actually pursue their, you know, follow their, uh, their interests and have a career. So to what extent do you think if you shift the focus away from numbers and graphs towards just the cultures we have in America, especially the culture towards consumption, the cult culture towards spending, uh, to what extent might it change and skew your, your, your views on, you know, on maybe what the role of the government is in society, or how much emphasis should we put on small business versus you know, uh, 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 having a, a, a decent minimum wage? Well, <clears throat> those are good questions. The first thing that worries me about the culture that you're suggesting is that you said government uh, gives you money to go to school, government pays your salary, government, 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 and that's one of the problems that we have is, okay, there ought to be a law. Whenever, whenever there's a problem now, we have too many people who say, let's let government solve the problem. The best measurement of taxation, of course, is not the tax revenue we pay, but government spending, because that's the total measure of resources they glom onto, either through taxation or through borrowing. That is, the total spending is really the measure of, of taxation. It's huge. Now, so are the, tax cuts part of spending? Pardon? For instance, the Bush tax cuts, do you consider that spending? No, spending is spending, and then the question is, how do you finance spending? You finance spending either by borrowing or taxing. So over here, you decide what's important for government to do, and then over here, you decide, how do I finance it? Do I go with Keynes 999? Do I go with a millionaire's tax? Do I take all of Bill Gates's $30 billion and give it to poor people? Or I mean, the rise, the, the rise of the national debt has just gone hand in hand with tax cuts. It starts out with the regular. Well, no, it's gone hand to hand with spending. And spending. tax cuts. <laughs> all right. Anyway, spending is what drives it. Otherwise, you don't, you know, you can give, you can have no taxes and you know, just try to borrow all the money, but I don't think that would be a good idea, would it? So that's, and, and the reason we borrow so much, of course, is that the politicians that do the spending for us are afraid to ask us to pay for it with taxes because there is an election coming and we don't like it. So spending is the measure of taxation, not taxes. Taxes are one way we finance it, borrowing is the other way we finance it, and the thing we have to decide is what's important to spend on. Tuition, I don't know, some government jobs are great, other job, government jobs are not great. We have to decide what it is we want to do. Then, let's go over and find out how to efficiently fund it. And that would be making a decision about taxes and about borrowing. So, next question over here. What would you think hypothetically of a new social security uh, bill like you have the option to decide to put like 40 percent to like a retirement account instead of putting like the full 6.4 uh, do you think that would help cut social security spending all right here's the problem there are a lot of ideas about social security that say you know if i could have just had the money and invested it for myself i'd do better you know, and there's a, there's a good case that one can make uh, for that. The problem is the transition to that. So Social Security is a, is a hand-to-mouth program, right? <clears throat> and, and in fact, the cash flow went negative uh, last year. We actually, because of the high unemployment, we actually wrote more out in checks than we took in in Social Security tax. So that means the general fund is now picking it up. Now, if I let you, young people, I'll oversimplify it. Keep your money and invest it yourself, 
after you sign and say, I'll never collect Social Security, right? I'll never put a claim on. I have an immediate cash flow problem because every dollar you send in, I'm handing out to somebody. So the transition problem to that, even though it might be a much more sensible program or some version of it, is that I don't, I, I, I don't know where we get the money to fill the gap, which takes, it'll take, you know, 30 years, 40 years to roll everybody over and out and so on. That's the difficulty. The funding, the fu the funding challenge is so large, we just don't know how exactly uh, we, can, we can do it. But if we go back far enough and small enough as we start at the 18-year-olds or something like that, some program like that could be put in, but it would create a funding problem because to the, to, uh, the more I let you keep and invest on your own, the less revenue I have to pay, the, to pay my Social Security. All right? And of course, when Social Security started, there were what, like 40 workers per check? How many are there today? Three, there are even, not even three now. 131 million people work today. 51 million, 53 million checks a month are written. 53 million. And pretty soon it'll be two workers to one. So two of you, two of you young people will write my check. Thank you very much. I appreciate your support. It's kind of like taking care of your parents again, isn't it? Uh, we're back. But uh, so that's the, that's the problem. It's, it, it has a, it's a neat concept. We're just not sure how to fund it in the transition, and that's really important because the Social Security deficit's one of the big issues, of course, going forward. I have a different solution, I would say, uh, to lighten the burden on you, which I think we should do. I think we should admit Social Security was a fraud and means test it. Bill Gates will get along fine without his Social Security. I would probably, I, I like the money, but I could probably get by without it because I saved and, and uh, so I have a private pension but you could means test it. And of course, if I did outlive my, my personal money, then of course I go on Social Security, right? Because then I would be poor after I ran out of money if I happened to live long. But the way to beat Social Security today only is just live long. <laughs> and, then, and then you win if you die early. If you die, you could pay in for 45 years and you die at 65, what do you get? Zero. $225 for burial, that hasn't changed. That's all you get. You paid in all those years. so. You know, we, we could really fix that and make it a lot better. Your, your approach is very interesting, and we've had a lot of discussions about it as economists. Um, I think from a pragmatic point of view, I had the cartoon up there about means testing. That's what we're going to do. That's where we'll end up. Yes? Uh, Mr. Donkelberg, this is a question relating to something uh, you said upon before, um, how uh, it'd be easier to buy the snow plow, you know, more capital, and then you said, like, the... Uh, the soldiers that were doing that would have something better to do. But right now, that's like kind of causing a big source of unemployment. It's just because of the new capital, more technology, it's making kids go to school longer. I do think that that's a big part of the, uh, uh, a part of our unemployment problem, and how do you fix something like that? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a good question. We have those arguments. Does technology cause, cause unemployment? Um, well, in the very short run, it can. Uh, if you have a big technological change at a factory, put in an assembly line where you didn't have one, you, know, you can reduce your need for labor. So my favorite example, of course, is back in agriculture. I, if you go back 50 years, there were 11 million people working in agriculture, with feeding 100 million fewer people. Uh, now, if you um, look at the agriculture sector, how many people do we have working there? Two million. Why? Well, because we invented the tractor and hybrid seeds that we grow all around the state here and uh, new technologies for fertilizer and blah, 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 blah. We, so that's all technological change that really raised worker productivity, uh, if you will, and allowed us to use far fewer people to feed the nation than uh, we needed it with otherwise. Now, we don't have... Uh, uh, see, I said five, I said 11 million down to two, so we don't have nine million unemployed farmers. You know, these transitions don't happen fast, usually it takes time. So f farmers' children don't stay on the farm because farming is very different. They come here and get a degree in uh, engineering and they make uh, computers or something like that. So that's the kind of transition that we usually have. So the general answer to that in the longer term is no, technological change doesn't cause unemployment. Remember, in 2000, we had the highest employment rate in history. 64.5% of the adult population had a job. With all those jobs, we allegedly lost to the Chinese, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If, they'd, if those people had come back looking for a job, we would have nothing for them. 
Uh, there was no room for them. So <clears throat> it's not really just, not, that's not really the problem. The problem really is you know, getting the economy to run better and smoother and stop shocking it and stop having bad policies, which you know, many arguably, I, and I agree with those arguments, say most of the business cycle problems we have come from mistakes made in Washington. When Washington's with their 35% of GDP now, when Washington makes a mistake, it's a big one. And it causes, has a lot of ramifications. So don't worry about technological change. It'll raise your, it'll raise your income. Yeah, but I, I, adding to that, it's also, you say that like from 2000, but when you look at how high our unemployment rate was, or our employment rate was then, it's our uh, advances in technology have been incredible since 2000. And it has caused a really uh, immediate increase in unemployment. Well, you, okay, you may think so, but I would suggest if you look at the nature of who are unemployed, they were not employed in tech firms or in firms that technology displaced. But that'd be a fun study to do, maybe for a paper. Are you taking economics? Uh, yes, sir. There you go. That's a paper for you to do. Go out and look at the micro data. Tons of it is available. Look at the unemployed. Where did they come from? And see if they got kicked out because of technological change. I would say no, since most of the unemployed that I, that I look at here came from housing. And uh, there's been some technological change there, but it's really a demand problem. And that's a different kind of a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, hi. I'm, uh, I'm glad you ended that comment with on demand problem, because I assume we everybody, everybody agrees that the demand problem is the problem. But uh, you also seem to be opposed to any kind of a job bill coming from Washington. Uh, how, where do you think the demand or the customers for small business will come from if there's not a demand bill that will actually directly hire people to allow them to get more income? Personally, I'm about to well, graduate in a, within a year with a medical engineering degree. I will likely, good chances are if I stay in Fort Wayne, I will find an employment with the defense contractor, which is obviously a job ultimately paid for by taxpayer money. Yeah, you're going to work for the government. Well, probably. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, all right, though. That's a good place for government to be. If that works for me, why can't we make that, make that work for these millions of unemployed construction workers, especially when there's a tremendous need in this country to fix up the infrastructure and to build up renewable energy base so we don't have to be reliant on fossil for burning fuels. So what jobs, what, what do you think government can do to stimulate job growth? Well, like I said, build the very things that the country needs. I mean, right now we're spending money to, we've been spending for years money to build up our defen defenses. Yeah. So why can't we do that for things that are not intended right, to uh, kill people? So let me uh, point out that the defense industry, many good things have come out of the defense industry besides bombs, but the de they don't employ many people because, again, it's one of those kinds of industries that's very capital intensive. So we can do a little bit more. Roads and bridges will employ a few more people, too. That was part of the jobs bill. The problem is what the president said, well, we'll put house construction workers back doing roads and bridges. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way because little teeny house construction firms in little towns around Indiana and Ohio that build houses have no equipment to do roads and bridges, nor do they have the, the kinds of skilled workers it takes. So it sounds good, but it's not the way you're going to get unemployed construction workers back to work because you just can't get enough of them enough of them have the, have the right qualifications or the right capital equipment to work with or a skill set. So, you know, the, so the jobs bill that's been proposed is not going to work. Common sense says it won't work, as I tried to walk you through, why it won't get people to, to be, the people to, that employ everybody in the U.S. to hire them. So you need something else. I think the best thing the government could do is simply <clears throat> resolve the uncertainty about debt, deficits and spending and let us know what path we're on. If we know that we're on a path that won't take us down the line of Greece and Germany, then we'll be more confident and we'll spend more money. We'll be more willing to spend rather than less willing to spend. 131 million people spending another $1,000. On average, there are a lot of big spenders in that that are still working. That would be $140 billion stimulus right there, spread nicely across the country where all these little firms can rehire all these people that they fired. That would be a good jobs bill. It doesn't say anything about jobs. It just says, here's how we're getting spending under control. Here's what we're going to do with taxes, yes or no, what it's going to look like. 
here's what we're going to do with the deficit, how, here's how big it'll be in three years, we're going to have balanced budget amendments, I don't know what it all is, but something that gives us faith and confidence in the future that will make us more willing to spend rather than less, and of course that will create jobs and raise and grow income in, in, the, in the economy, if we can do that. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Well, a little earlier you said, uh, and I'll paraphrase, uh, businesses don't need tax breaks, they need customers. Can you get a little closer? Uh, <coughs> you know, Al and I have that problem. You said, uh, businesses, What's for dinner? Businesses don't need tax breaks, they need customers. Well, in your opinion, can we bring those customers back, uh, the U.S. customers, by increasing the price of foreign goods, of imports, through tariffs and such? Is that a valid solution? Can we bring the customers back to U.S. businesses by increasing tariffs? And no. No. <clears throat> we tried that whole tariff thing, you know, before, and, they're, and it's coming in a new form because the Senate just passed that kind of, you know, uh, don't, me don't mess with your currency bill, which is kind of the same kind of a deal. <clears throat> we know that doesn't work. Free trade works. It works best for everybody. Um, that's why the U.S. is so wealthy as a country. We have 50 countries, California, Texas, and New York is ten, three of the ten largest countries in the world. We have free trade, free mobility of labor, the same currency, <clears throat> and barriers to trade between the two don't make any sense. We don't want California to, <clears throat> to have to make all of its own cars. We don't want people in Michigan who make cars to have to make their own wine because neither of them are good at doing those things. Specializing trade is the key. So anything we do to, keep, to prevent the free flow of capital and labor uh, which permits specialization would be to the detriment of us and our trading partners, both. We all lose, so we've kind of proved that, I think, uh, before. Yes? Hi. Well, uh, the talk uh, leaves me a little depressed. Uh, Sorry about I that. I mean, it seems that one thing you mentioned was that, you know, regulations are a problem, but it seemed like with the crisis of we just recently had with the banking industry and so forth, deregulation was the problem. Um, and the other thing I wanted to make, so, you know, that's the other issue I wanted to bring up was the uh, economic you know, inequalities at a very high level today. And what, one solution you put forth to create jobs was lower the minimum wage. How are people going to buy things? Well, first of all, <clears throat> most people who live, who earn, who, who earn the minimum wage are from above median income families. A lot of people here in the room, they're not, you know, you don't get this, the, you don't find a minimum wage worker with a family of four in New York because it would be impossible to live in New York on a, a minimum wage salary. So there's a lot of myth in the whole minimum wage thing. So most of the people who earn the minimum wage are not people that you want to help anyway. Poor people don't work. And so they're not on the minimum wage. And the higher we make the minimum wage, the harder it will always be for them to ever get a job, get their first job, get on the job training. So they're on welfare. They're not on the minimum wage. So my view is uh, simply, you know, stop raising the hurdle. I mean, you know, if you could get a minimum wage of 50000 for two thousand or $50 an hour, that would be 100000 for everybody working out. Well, is that going to work? I don't think so, because you have trouble getting people hired that who can't produce a value equivalent to $50 an hour. So that's not gonna, that's not gonna really do it. Uh, I think if you let people work, I look around North Philadelphia and see all these people who, you know, who need to work and could work and could add value, but maybe not at the minimum wage, at least when they start. Uh, most people who start at the minimum wage don't stay at the minimum wage. They, they get past it. So <clears throat> I think overall, the cost of the minimum wage is very high. Uh, and uh, we take care of people who don't earn money and can't earn money differently through the welfare system because they don't, need, they don't work. So the minimum wage is irrelevant. It's only relevant to those people if they decide they want to work. It's the hurdle they have to convince an employer they can get over. And as we keep raising it, it's going to be harder and harder. So if you can't get your first job and you're standing on the street corner, age doesn't make you a better worker. We need to let People, young people get in, get experience, on-the-job training, and that will make them more productive workers going forward and give them many more opportunities than trying to raise the minimum wage, which, again, impacts mostly people we're not trying to help anyway. 
But a good question. <clears throat> Do I have one over here? Thank you, Dr. Dunkelberg. That was our final question for the evening. That well, was our final question for the that evening. That was my final question. All right. Well, you've been a great audience. The nicest thing I can say, of course, is that I've given a lecture. I don't have to pick up papers and grade them. So uh, I, I'm honored to be invited as part of the seminar series. I hope I didn't let you down. And uh, I wish you all the best. We will get through this stuff. This is America. We're entrepreneurial. We're hardworking. Lots of ideas. And we do have a better legal system than everybody else. We'll, we'll get through the mess. It's just take a little bit of time. But, you know, look past that. <clears throat> we'll always be great, at least in our lifetime. So thank you all very much. Have a good holiday. <clears throat>